The reading of the scripture for today comes from Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 and 23 and Galatians chapter 2 verse 15 through 21. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification come through the law, Then Christ died for nothing. The reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, if you've been following us for the last uh, few weeks now, you know that I have been uh, preaching a series of sermons that I have uh, uh, labeled fruitful. And we have focused on the fruit of the Spirit. And the reason why is following Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to dwell in the body of believers and filled each of the believers with the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit then does something within us. We are in a relationship with Christ and the scripture is clear to tell us that if we abide in Christ and His Spirit abides in us, if we're connected to the vine, that uh, we will produce certain characteristics, there will be certain organic outgrowth or produce that Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. And we've been looking at each one of those and focusing on them. We have looked at love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity or goodness. But today I want us to look at uh, faithfulness. And uh, if you was to look at the Old Testament or the New Testament in the original language, it would be written in Greek, and the Greek word for faithfulness is pestos. And it means to be trustworthy, truthful, reliable, confident, and loyal. Now, faithfulness is like other fruits. It is not self-generated. It is a gift of God. Our faithfulness is not a result of our own striving, our own struggle. It is the outgrowth of God's grace, which He is doing in us. And if we are a Christ follower, we are going to exhibit and reflect faithfulness. There is no boasting about uh, our faith on our own. Those who, have faithful, those who are faithful have no need to boast uh, and it, no need to call attention to themselves. When we do that, we can sometimes get ourselves into a lot of trouble. I think of Jesus' story in Luke chapter 18. It's the story of uh, the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee and the tax collector both go up to the temple one day to pray. And the Pharisee, the scripture said, poised and prayed to himself. That's interesting. It is not like he prayed to God. Rather, it is like he is communicating to God uh, about himself. Um, and, and God says, he says to God, God, you are 
mighty lucky to have me. If we had more people like me, we wouldn't have all the problems that we have in the world. Um, I am not like the robbers and the thugs and the thieves, and especially I'm not like this publican, this Pharisee, or this tax guy that is over here. The Pharisee would like to think that he is actually a poster child of pestos, or faithfulness. Meanwhile, the tax man prays what we call the sinner's prayer. It's a very simple prayer, very humble prayer, very honest prayer. He says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Guess which one of these went to their homes that day justified? It was the tax guy. Now, Jesus adds a little P.S. to this story. He says, if you go around with your nose in the air, you're going to wind up flat on your face. But if you are willing to somehow be yourself, you will, by God's grace, become more. The name Philip Yancey will be familiar with some. Back a few years ago, he wrote a book, What's So Amazing About Grace. It was a, a bestseller, and you could not only buy it in bookstores, but in the supermarkets as well, you could buy that little book. And a lot of people bought it and, and found it to be very inspirational. And he says in that book, Grace does not depend upon what we have done for God, but rather what God has done for us. He goes on to say, if you ask people what they uh, uh, have to do to go to heaven, most will say to be good. But Jesus contradicts this answer. He says all we have to do to go to heaven is cry, help. A different approach to this week's sermon. Um, I want to take a little different approach. I would like to spend a little time giving you the backstory to Paul's letter to the Galatians, particularly pertaining to the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of faithfulness. Uh, Paul wrote this little letter, which contains only five chapters, as a prescription for a mess that the church had gotten into. Uh, and it was really threatening the heart of Christianity. He knew these issues, if they were not addressed, could abort the gospel message in its infancy. So he wanted to address it. He was not only wanting to address it, but he was passionate about addressing it to the church. Now, church history tells us that Paul uh, planted these churches in Asia Minor, in a region called Galatia which is uh, an area that included Lystria and Derby, Antioch, and some others. And Paul went to Asia Minor sometimes uh, in or around uh, the Jerusalem Conference. And we read about the Jerusalem Conference in Acts chapter 15, and he also cites it here in Galatians chapter 2. It was a time when the elders of the church actually affirmed Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. The gospel movement began as a Jewish renewal uh, movement, but in this second generation of the church, it was uh, now rapidly spreading to all the Gentiles, and it was spreading like wildfire. Paul's trip to Galatia uh, was while he was looking for some medical help, and uh, somewhere around 48 uh, CE, and he preached to them while he was there. He proclaimed uh, the grace of God who was crucified and risen. And the response that he received in res back was, res was uh, terrific. And Paul never stayed in one place too long, so he moved on to the next mission post after he had preached the gospel to him. And it wasn't long after that that it came to Paul's attention that the work in Galatia was being undermined by another missionary group who had come in there and was preaching what the Scripture calls a different gospel. Now, how was it different? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
It was a different gospel in this regard. They said Jesus was the Messiah. They affirmed what Paul said about that. The long-awaited one and that Jesus' grace was important for salvation. Notice they did not say it was essential for salvation. It was necessary for salvation. But it was important for salvation. But this group taught that in order to take the next step, That circumcision was now mandatory, absolutely necessary. Now, Paul had failed to properly instruct the people in regard to the Torah, they said. They were teaching that in order to accept the gospel, you must accept the Jewish law, which included circumcision, dietary restrictions, and Sabbath observances. It was important. For these uh, people to become Jewish proselytes, if you will, and embrace the Torah. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? It uh, doesn't sound too uh, far-fetched to me. Well, God's grace is not enough for your salvation if you have to add something to it. If Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, and He is, then salvation is not a matter of Jesus plus anything not cultural practices my theological practices or ideas my ethnic heritage my denomination nothing else we all have our plus one plans I guess it sounds like an insurance program Uh, grace plus one you know Uh, grace plus circumcision grace search plus Torah grace plus dietary or Sabbath restrictions and so forth. The truth of the matter is, Jesus plus anything ruins everything. And Paul could not be silent about this. And so, this became a similar problem in the church in the 16th century when a German monk by the name of Martin Luther addressed the church, and protested the church's practice. The church was teaching it was Jesus plus indulgences. It's Jesus plus confession. It is Jesus plus offering. And Luther advocated something called Christ alone. He went on to say that any of that... uh, Anything like that, that it not only clouds Christ, but it cuts Christ out altogether. He was wanting to preach Christ only. Now, there is a Presbyterian minister that pastors in the West. Her name is Heidi Armstrong. And she said this in an article recently. If anything else can be said than the gospel, than the gospel uh, it has been derailed. And it is the works, words of Paul, in the words of Paul, she said, Christ died for nothing. If it's anything but the gospel, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, it derails the gospel message. And in the words of Paul, Christ died for nothing. Now this had become a serious matter in Galatia. So much so that Paul wrote in chapter 5, verse 4, these words, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been uh, alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Eugene Peterson uh, gave a gift to the church. He wrote a paraphrase of the Bible. It's called The Message. And in his preface to the book of Galatians, he wrote these words. When men and women gets their hands on religion, one of the first things they often do is turn it into an instrument of controlling others, either putting them in their place or keeping them in their place. It is little wonder that those who have experienced religion on those terms often see an escape from it as freedom. The problem is that freedom turns out to be short-lived not the law not the Torah not anything else but Jesus Christ and him crucified was 
Paul's message. And others were distorting that. Plato says good people don't need laws to tell them how to act responsibly. And bad people will find a way around the laws. What's the point? We need law, civil law. Law is a gift of God. And Paul was clear about that. But the law cannot compel us to do the right thing. The law is temporary. It's limited. It cannot save us. Only grace can save us. I must confess that I have a rather hard time trusting grace. I was raised with the idea that if something is given to you, it is given with the expectation that something will be given back. My parents used to tell me there is no free lunch. If somebody is giving you something, usually there is an ulterior motive. I was taught that you work for what you have. And that sometimes causes me to be afraid of grace. Because if I'm going to have to work for it, and I'm going to hold anything given to me suspect, then God, who freely offers to me grace without expecting anything in return, and not wanting me to work for it or earn it in any shape, form, or fashion, it's, it's almost that it's different from what I've always been taught in life. And, and I have to somehow com, uh, make myself conform to the fact that with grace, God's grace, it becomes an exception to the rule. Now that was the case for these missionaries who followed Paul to Galatia. Like Paul's message, they were so concerned that if you emphasize grace, that people would take advantage of it and cheapen it. They're going to water it down, and we do. And Paul talks about that in places. He said, should we continue in, to continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Well, the more you sin, the more grace you receive, right? Well, that's cheapening it. That's watering it down. Grace is the gift of God. It's the precious, sacred gift of God. Um, the trouble with grace is that it's just so unfair. Especially when it is shown to anyone other than me who does not deserve it. When I think of grace and unfairness, I always think of the story of Jonah. Now, Jonah was a little suspicious of God's grace because God seemed to love Jonah's enemies. And it was too much for Jonah. You remember that God called Jonah to preach grace and repentance to the uh, uh, Ninevites. I call uh, Jonah the uh, prodigal prophet for good reason. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach the gospel. Now, Jonah didn't like the Ninevites. And perhaps you and I would not have liked the Ninevites either. You say, well, why didn't Jonah like the Ninevites? Well, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And in 721 BCE, or somewhere in that area, the Assyrians came through Israel and raised the nation and deported the people into bondage. Now, you would have not have liked them either had you been one of the Israelites. Now, Jonah is being called by God to go to these enemies and preach the gospel. So what did Jonah do? You remember? He said, uh, no, I don't think so. And instead he boarded a ship. And he went in the exact opposite direction to Tarsus. As far as he could go in the opposite direction. And still be visible on the map. Now while he was sailing to Tarsus. There was a storm that arose on the sea, and uh, as a result, he uh, was thrown overboard and got swallowed up by a great fish. And while he was in the belly of this great fish, he said, well, all right, I think I'll go to the Ninevites and preach the gospel. I think I would have too. And so he now 
is reluctantly obedient and he is going to the Ninevites to preach the gospel and the sermon that he preached was not very good and it was extremely short. He said, in 40 days, God will overturn Nineveh. That's all he said. And when he said that, the people accepted his message and repented of their sins. There was a great revival in Nineveh. And when that happened, Jonah complained to the Lord and said, Lord, I knew this is what you would do. This is why I didn't want to respond to your call. How are we ever going to get even with the Ninevites now that we have called them to repentance? It's a shame when people who have received grace upon grace upon grace wants to withhold it from others. You see, when we are not showing grace, we're not mindful of the grace that we have received. This is the backdrop of Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. It happened in Galatia and Paul refused to be silent about what was happening. He wanted to make sure that people understood, accepted the fact that it was by grace alone that people were saved. And he gives to us a formula for successful faith in God. Grace plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. There's a little poem that was written by Annie Johnson Flint that uh, perhaps drives this home better than anything I've seen. These are the words that she wrote. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. He adds affliction. To added affliction, he adds his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto men. For out of His rich resources in Jesus, He giveth, And giveth and giveth again. Paul is wanting the Galatians to understand a very simple truth. He is faithful in preaching the gospel. Faithful in the message. And wanted them to be now faithful to receiving it and practicing it. And we also should be faithful in receiving the gospel. And in living it out in our life so that we become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ in the world in which we live. Maybe that's the reason Paul gave it to us as one of the fruit of the Spirit that manifests itself when the Spirit of God lives within us. There is the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness. Is your life producing those things, that fruit? Does people look at you and they see those characteristics and those qualities in you? If so, it might be that you are abiding in Christ and His Spirit is abiding in you. If not, then it may be that you need to rededicate your life to Christ so that your life can reflect those characteristics, that spiritual fruit that is the organic outgrowth of God's Spirit within us. Amen.